Okay, this sermon is entitled, Stupid Justifications for Salvific Loss. I'd like to open up with prayer, and then with a few verses. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 120 reads, In my distress I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips, and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Now, when it comes to these stupid, unsaved false prophets who teach salvific loss, these people do not have any valid or tenable arguments on their side, so they have to desperately resort to what I've called stupid justifications. And I've had people claim that they believed in eternal security, but they just didn't know what to do with all these so-called arguments and the verses that these unsaved reprobates use So I'd like to break into my notes and explain seven different quote-unquote stupid justifications for salvific loss and how they don't work at all. Number one, these people claim that man's free will is not eradicated once they get saved. And they are literally teaching that a man can use his free will to either lose, forfeit, or get rid of his salvation. Now people do have free will before and after salvation, But that does not mean that they can undo the power of God. And the analogical illustration I give would be a person on a high-rise building thinking that he can jump off the building and somehow magically sprout wings and then fly away to safety. When the reality of this would be if a person did jump off a high-rise building, he would quickly fall to the ground and then splat like the wily coyote. So the point is, is that free will does not overpower God or cause salvific loss in any way, shape, or form. The second argument they use, or the second stupid justification, would be the so-called warning passages in Scripture, mainly in the New Testament. They claim that there are warnings for the believer about losing salvation. Now, these warnings do not exist because salvation cannot be lost, otherwise God is a liar and the Word of God is contradictory and untrustworthy, But let's take a look at one of the passages they like to use. Turn over to Romans chapter 11. It reads in verse 22, Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Now in Romans chapter 11, we're dealing with God's chosen people, and this is about the nation of Israel. In verse 7 it reads, What then Israel hath not obtained, that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So we're not dealing with individual people losing their salvation or being cut off from God salvifically. This is talking about national Israel, and all you have to do is just jump back to verse 1, and it proves that God does not cast away his people. It reads, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. So this is not threatening anyone with salvific loss. And this is not a warning passage because, like I said, they don't exist. The third stupid justification for salvific loss is that a person can stop believing and that equals loss of salvation. Turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. It reads in verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now what's ironic about this is that salvific loss is a doctrine of devils. So if anyone could lose their salvation, it would be these stupid, unsaved, non-osassers. But see, all this verse is conveying to us is that a person can fall away from the faith due to a demonic doctrine, But this does not say anything about him losing salvation. Now turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We have another example of this. Let's start off with verse 9. We'll stop with verse 10 and it reads, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. These people claim that Demas is an example of somebody who lost their salvation. All this says is that he hath forsaken me, and he loved this present world. It does not say anything about him losing salvation. 
All these people are doing is just reading that or interpolating that into the text. It's garbage. The next stupid justification for salvific loss are the if conditions. These people claim that the Bible says you're saved if you do this or that. Fill in the blank. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's start off with verse 1 and we'll stop with verse 2 and it reads, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Well, they claim that these people were only saved if they keep in memory what Paul preached unto them. But see, this is not talking about eternal salvation here. It's talking about the sanctification of the believer. And the reason why we know this is because, number one, the condition for salvation is not keeping something in memory. The Bible says in Acts chapter 16 and verse 30, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31 clearly tells them, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He's addressing these people as brethren in verse 1. So he's not telling them how to get saved all over again. This is a bunch of stupidity, and there are no if conditions when it comes to salvation, and that is because God is the one that saves us by grace. Man has nothing to do with it in terms of human performance or merit. The next stupid justification for salvific loss is that, well, eternal life is a free gift, but you can get rid of a free gift, just like a physical gift. Well, this is a bunch of garbage because, number one, this reduces eternal life to some pathetic trinket or something that you can receive in the flesh. That's not what salvation is. Turn over to Romans chapter 11 again. Let's take a look at verse 29 and it reads, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Salvation is a gift. It's based on God's calling and it says they're without repentance. In other words, God would have to repent in order to give your salvation back. And that never happens. God is not an Indian giver and salvation is irreversible. Number six, these people claim that the seal can be broken when it deals with the Holy Spirit. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. Now this has to be the dumbest argument I've ever heard. In Ephesians chapter 4 it reads in verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now the word sealed in the Greek is sprogizo. And this literally means a permanent or secure seal. It's another word for a pledge or down payment. It's a marketing term with legal implications. It's akin to what we know as a deposit insurance. And one benefit of deposit insurance is that it's protected by the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Incorporation. And that guarantees that nobody has access to your money or your funds. And that's the same way with salvation. Not even Satan himself can undo the seal. And the simple fact that it says we are sealed unto the day of redemption guarantees that the seal cannot be broken. Because if it could, it wouldn't be until the day of redemption. It would be until you somehow broke it. And I guess the Holy Spirit is inept and cannot adequately seal us, according to these stupid unsaved hellbound reprobates. Finally, the seventh stupid justification for salvific loss is that Judas was saved. These idiots claim this to try to say that he lost his salvation. Turn back to John chapter 17. Judas was never saved. The Bible is clear on this, and this is, like I said, an idiotic argument. It reads in verse 12, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, these unsaved false prophets, they claim that Judas just lost his salvation here, but the simple fact that he's referred to as the son of perdition proves that he was never saved. Because saved people do not go by that title. They're called brethren, or sons of God, or saints. We also have another verse that proves that Judas was never saved. Turn back to John chapter 6. It reads in verse 64. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. So according to that, Judas Iscariot was never a believer, he was never saved, therefore he did not lose his salvation, he just never had salvation. And he is self-same with all these stupid devils who think that you can lose salvation, they don't have salvation either. So watch out for these false prophets. 
and all their stupid justifications, all they are are just pathetic attempts to try to pervert what the scripture clearly teaches, and that is that the believer in Christ has eternal life, they shall never perish, they will be raised up at the last day, they'll never hunger, they'll never thirst, they'll never die, and they have everlasting life that can never be lost. And all we need to prove this is just John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And there are no verses in the Bible that negate that promise and that truth. So that's why these stupid unsaved devils have to resort to stupid anti-biblical justifications for their retarded teaching. That's all I have. Let me go ahead and close in prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.